Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very happy to welcome to Forward Guides for the first time, Johnny Matthews of Super Macro. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jack. I mean, I've seen some of your previous guests that have been on here, and they are a tough act to follow. I have to be honest, you've had some brilliant, brilliant people on the show. Well, thank you, Johnny, but, but you fit the bill. Uh, you've had quite a storied career, some of the biggest and best uh, hedge fund investment firms in the business. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into macro. In a nutshell, Jack, I joined Salomon Brothers. It was taken over by Citigroup. I spent 11 years there as a trader. Then I joined one of Europe's largest hedge funds, Brevin Howard. I was a portfolio manager. I became a partner. I managed several hundred million dollars, and I, I had a portfolio of equity derivatives, fixed income, FX, and I traded a little bit of credit. And since then, after I left, I started investing for myself and trading for myself. And I found about three or four years ago that I needed to, to look in greater detail at uh, the macro research that I was reading, try to understand try to do my own research and get a better understanding of macro. And as a result of that, my trading improved a great deal. And I started writing about it. I started writing for a broker and my daily note is dri distributed probably to um, recipients in pretty much every single major investment bank in the city and most of the large hedge funds. And I found that by writing about macro, it forced me to really delve deeper into, into the details. And it, it's really improved my trading a great deal, partly because I'm not doing stupid little intraday trades without a good fundamental reason. I'm too busy writing the note. But also, you know, it's, it's given me much more confidence to take quite long-term positions that I can stick with. So, Johnny, it's my understanding that you've been short bonds for a while which has obviously worked out great, but that you are short no longer. So to tell us why were you short duration, you know, interest rates, tenure, you tell us how you, you, you put on the trade, what motivated that trade. And then as the time evolved, the fundamentals changed, the price change, how is, has your outlook changed? And then take us to today where it, you know, it's, it's an open book. It could go any way. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I first put this trade on, it was as we were coming out of the pandemic, and it was very, very clear to me that with the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus that the economy had had, plus the revenge spending that everybody was keen to do, myself included, um, and the experience, the experience of just trying to book a flight, trying to book a hotel, anything like that, you know, everything was booked up for months in advance, you were paying top dollar for everything and lucky to get a seat. Whether it's a, you know, whether it's a, a show or a sporting event, everything was just getting booked up straight away. And this was this was just as things were getting back on their feet. Now, this was in early 2022. We had inflation that had already gone past seven percent, and the 10-year treasury yield was yield at about one and a half percent. So that was a very, very easy trade for me. I felt absolutely sure it was going a lot higher. And I think it, at the time I put it on in, in quite large size and I've stuck with the trade until very recently. I reduced the size coming into this year. It became a lot more choppy. I didn't believe that the Silicon Valley implosion and uh, Signature Bank were systemic events. And I wrote about it at the time in my note. And that was an opportunity to really build the trade up again. I think the treasury got down to about 3.3%. So I built it up again then. And I also really never subscribed to the idea that an inverted yield curve was indicative of a recession. I really didn't. Sure, you know, you can find that a relationship that fits through history but just because the yield curve's inverted, it shouldn't really imply that the economy is definitely going into a, a recession. It, it's just, it just shows that people are aware that the Fed has hiked rates a long way, and they expect them to reverse those hikes pretty soon. 
So I've been quite a recession denier for the last <laughs> 16, 17 months. And that's worked out well for America. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've... I used to do a weekly presentation to a bunch of US brokers who would laugh at me because I was saying, you know, there's nothing in this data that indicates we're going into a recession. You've got to ignore the inverted yield curve. But like I said to you earlier, you know, with the yield that touched 5% recently, and I I I don't I I don't rule out the possibility that we still go beyond that, maybe up to five and a half percent. I'm really not ruling out that possibility. But the risk reward isn't there now. It really isn't. And we had <clears throat> we had real yields that were up almost at two and a half percent on tips. They're now about two point three percent. I think those make really solid investments. And for the ten year treasury now where it is at four seventy five, I do think you're going to earn a real real income over the next 10 years that's not going to be destroyed by inflation or or by a catastrophic uh, fall in the price of the bond so i think it's it's much more difficult to stay with a fixed income short at this stage of the game it's, so you described a, a fundamental situation you were being paid x on fixed income and inflation was many, many times of, of of that to what degree are you also thinking about the supply and demand of us treasury us government running very large fiscal deficits so issuing uh, paper sometimes it's issuing you know, a lot of short-term bills, but but you know increasing this year it's been it's been notes and bonds or it will be in in the future, and then the demand banks they can buy less because their balance sheets are shrinking and they bought so much you know hedge funds they're levered and it's a negative carry trade to borrow overnight to buy a ten year some stuff going on with Japanese Japanese investors or, you know because of the pickup you know, I'm not going to pretend that I you know I understand that but uh, tell us but when you analyze it from the supply and demand perspective. What was your analysis and what is your analysis now? I do find that analyzing the supply and demand is, is, is very challenging. One thing I will say is that if you look at, if you look at the size of the fiscal deficit um, during uh, periods of expansion and recession, you'll find the fiscal deficit blows out during a recession. When unemployment goes up, you have the automatic stabilizers, mm -hmm. unemployment benefits just go through the roof and so the fiscal deficit blows out now it's very strange to be at this stage of the economic cycle with such a massive fiscal deficit and so there is a a, a stepped up increase in, in in the supply of bonds and almost regardless of what happens to growth it's going to stay big if growth collapses we're going to have a, an increase in the unemployment benefits that will just blow out that fiscal deficit even to an even greater extent. I've looked at estimates for the deficit for next year, which, which are generally lower than we have this year. There are a number of one-off factors this year that I'm sure you're aware of, you know, lower tax revenues, a big uplift in cost of living allowance at the start of the year, and so on and so forth. So those are one-off factors that won't affect it, won't affect the deficit next year. But if we do go into a serious slowdown, it's just going to blow out again. So that is one of the things that makes me think that I think we've entered a, a structural era of, I won't say permanently, but much higher rates, higher inflation, higher deficits, and higher long-term bond yields. So I, I remember talking to an oil analyst, an, an old timer, and he talked to me about supply. I said, but what about oil demand? And he said, Jack, if you you know, go through the record books about like how to calculate oil demand, I made those equations up and they're total nonsense. Like no one knows how to forecast oil demand. And it's interesting you say that. I mean, supply is is known or or it can be estimated, but demand it's it's re it's really tough to to see. But in a, in a recession, bonds rally. That is something of a something of a law of nature, or or is it not? Right. I mean, if if we enter a recession, the U.S. government will run larger deficits. That would be one in which the fixed income does okay or right yes I, I don't disagree so that's what that's what makes it such a challenge to to, to map supply and demand dynamics onto the changes in long-term yields uh, because you have this issue where the supply is going to ramp up but the demand will also ramp up because of expectations of future interest rates 
I mean, the way things are at the moment, yes, yeah, supply is higher, but there is a price for everything. So, you know, at the right yields, you can you can clear that supply. And as, as from my perspective, I just think that yield is higher than it would otherwise have been without this additional supply. So you, you do look at su supply and demand, but it sounds like your primary lens is looking at the economy and how new economic data is going to perform relative to the assumptions. So, you know, if, if people think inflation is going to be 5% and it's 4%, that could be bullish for bonds. If people think growth is going to be 3% and it's 2%, that's, bu that's bullish for bonds. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think the challenges that we've got going forward or that the U.S. has, same, same in the U.S., is, is getting service, inflation, service sector inflation back under control. You know, if you look at the components of inflation, I think core services, that services excluding energy services in the US, I think they're still running at something like 5.7%. Sure, we've had a big decline in headline inflation, but you know, it's, it's, it's primarily, well, a big chunk of that is base effects from energy and goods prices. Mm -hmm. And we're coming to the end of that now. So goods price inflation is going to, it is currently zero, and maybe it'll, you know, settle out at half a percent, one percent, whatever. Energy inflation, well, we just don't know. But services inflation, I think it's going to take a long time to get that really back down to two percent, or, or yeah, perhaps we won't do for for many many years. So, what's your economic outlook right now? So, you you were a recession denier. Tell us about the data you've seen over the past two, three months, have you been processing that data? I have to say there are some concerning changes in, in the data. The US is fortunate you've got these weekly claims data, which is a, it's almost like a real time snapshot of the labor market. And <clears throat> what we're seeing is the initial jobless claims, they're still pretty low. Uh, they're undeniably low, but the continuing claims have been inching higher for the last three or four weeks. I think they are in in today's print. They're something like the highest since July, and that suggests to me that okay, companies are not firing people, but they're not hiring at the same pace as they were. So someone that loses their job now is going to take a lot longer to find well, uh, longer to find a new job. So that's that's one of my concerns in in this high frequency data. Up to now, the payrolls have been surprisingly robust. You know, we entered this year with almost a half a million new jobs in January. The monthly pace of payroll growth slowed throughout the year, but in the last two months, it's picked up again. And of course, we had a much higher than expected payroll print in in September. But for October, I think the we'll see, possibly we'll see the auto workers. You know, their, their, their strike will show up in the manufacturing payrolls, maybe 30,000, 35,000 less, less jobs there. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if we see a slower pace of payroll growth going forward. When it comes to other factors, obviously the third quarter was just exceptional, but third quarter growth was boosted by inventory accumulation and fiscal spending. Those two factors won't be repeated in the current quarter. Consumption growth was just off the charts and i think i think it's almost bound to slow down quite a bit in the current quarter so i think you know the 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 pace of growth is slowing i don't think that there is anything that we've seen so far that suggests we're going into a, a recession i think we're going to have a slow growth period and hopefully things will either settle at a on a slightly uh, shallower trajectory or all growth will pick up again during next year a year ago many folks were saying the same thing if they, if they didn't forecast a recession they said we will have a slowdown how would you assess the past year in terms of, of economic growth in nominal or real terms and, and how do you even talk about or think about an economy where growth slows from nine percent to six percent yes it's a slowing down of growth but six percent is still pretty good we're, still we're talking good. nominal here yeah 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 well, first of all, I, I mean, the great thing about nominal, a uh, high rate of nominal GDP growth is it, it brings down the, the debt to GDP. 
And that's one of the reasons. I, I, I think US debt to GDP got to about 130% and it's come down to 120, maybe just a bit below 120%. So one of the ways that a government can get out of a, a fiscal mess is just to sustain high levels of nominal GDP growth. That's the best way out of it. While if you can, conning investors into to paying unrealistic prices for your, for your bond issues. Of course, you can't repeat that year after year. At some point, you've got to address the fiscal deficit. Um, in terms of what do I think going forward? Well, I think, of course, we had that 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 strong period of what people call revenge spending coming out of the pandemic. People were just desperate to go out and sp and spend money on on travel and leisure stuff that they couldn't do during the pandemic. Now, from what I can see, <clears throat> you still have very strong labour demand. In fact, labour demand. In fact, Powell said labour demand still exceeds the supply of available workers, and that's true. That's very true. Just the most recent JOLTS data showed you still got a ratio of something like one and a half times as many uh, vacancies as there are unemployed workers. Now, that's a much higher ratio than anything we saw prior to the pandemic. In the, in the, in the two decades of data that, the, that we have on, on, on from JOLTS. And that is not unique to the US. That, that excess demand for labor over available supplies, not unique to the states. About a year ago, the OECD did a study and showed that in most of the top 20 advanced economies, that ratio of vacancies to unemployed workers was much higher than it had been prior to the pandemic, much, much higher. So there does seem to be some sort of almost a global shortage of labor. And all the time that we have this demand for labor, keeping employment on an upward path, we're not going to dip into a, a recession. It takes a heck of a lot to put the economy into a recession. And we just haven't, we just don't have those, any reason for it to happen at this stage. So um, I'm going to propose two pushbacks that, that you would hear from someone who remains in the, the recession camp. And, you know, it goes without saying the recession camp folks, they have been wrong. Eventually they'll be right, but it's about timing. And the, you know, recession denier camp that, that you've been in ha has been right for, for the U.S. So those two lines of question has been, number one, Johnny, you talked about uh, labor data. Labor data is very lagging. It shows a, a portrait of what was in the past you've got to look at forward-looking data leading indicators. And the second one is is actually denying that they, they capture anything meaningful, saying that, you know, for example, Jolt captures all sorts of job openings that are, that are posted by companies where the, the marginal cost of putting up that, that job advertisement is close to $0, whereas back in the day, you'd have to you know, pay a newspaper a lot of money, say, hey, we, we need this, this person, so you can't you know, assign it to a historical basis. So you know, what would you say to the folks who say, you got to look at ISM. I guess you got to look at the, the, the yield curve. Well, uh, well, first and foremost, I want to make this point that quite often uh, with economic analysis that I read, uh, the economists, when things aren't going their way, they will say, well, there's this wrong with the data or there's that wrong with the data. If it's the payrolls, it'll be, oh, it's all the birth deaths adjustment mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, it's people working two jobs at any one time. But I have to tell you, first of all, that establishment survey takes a, is, is a very, very well-run uh, survey. And the Labor Department is stuffed full of PhDs in e economics and statistics. You know, and, and so there's no reason to doubt that they're doing something wrong or, or fiddling this data somehow. It is what it is. And we've just seen a very, very strong period of job growth. The JOLTS data, I agree with you. The survey response rate is quite low. And like you say, it's, you know, the marginal cost of posting an ad is, these days is, is, is very low. But it's, that is a very lagging indicator. That really is because, it, you know, it's a couple of months uh, delayed before we get to see it. But you have other more, more high-frequency data, like, like the claims data, like I said. And we're, not, we're just not seeing really much of a pickup in claims. I mean, two, what was it today? 217,000. 
sure, it's gone up by 5,000 since the prior week. It, it's nothing. That Those initial jobless claims are still running at a very, very low level. The, the pickup in continuing claims does concern me a little bit, but it's nothing to freak out about at, at this stage of the game. When it comes to the ISM surveys, well, the manufacturing survey is is kind of strange because it just seemed to fall off a cliff. It looked like we turned a corner a couple of months ago, and then in this most recent survey, it just it just it just well collapsed basically. But manufacturing is only about I think manufacturing is responsible for only about eight percent of the workforce. So the true test will be tomorrow's ISM services index. We want to see continued strength in that. But it's, I, you know, it's very difficult to find one particular forward indicator of, of labor demand and say, well, okay, you know, that, that's what I'm going to focus on. You know, you just need to take inputs from, from, from as many different sources as you can. What about the uh, more cyclical parts of the economy, I think, that are adding fewer jobs or even shedding jobs, manufacturing, construction, part of that where, okay, yes, services employment is, is going gangbusters, but typically go, you know, going into a recession, the first industries to shed labor are those you know, manufacturing jobs. Well, there have been periods, I think 2015 and other periods where manufacturing has been in a, a recession. Mm -hmm. but the rest of the economy hasn't mm -hmm. so it is it is you know let's let's face it it is a small part of the economy and it can do its own thing we had a, a very strange period during the pandemic where you know there was this massive demand for goods because uh, people couldn't buy anything else they just sat at home pressing buttons on amazon and and ordering stuff and they really had nothing else to spend their money on. So that really just caused all the, you know, the, the, and, and the supply chains were all snarled up. And so, you know, there was a kind of delay in, in manufacturing these goods and a catch up period. And then all of a sudden you have this excess, uh, excessive inventories that have to be worked off. And I think we're still going through that post pandemic working off of the excess inventories. So manufacturing still hasn't really stabilized and found its feet, but hopefully we'll be coming towards the end of that process. Tell me about your calculation of excess savings, which is, I think, the source of a lot of the strength in the American economy is just people have a lot more money. And I know depending on how you calculate it in a macro way, you can get a very you know a bullish, optimistic outlook or a super pessimistic one, depending, you know, like all models, depending on what, you, what your inputs are. Just go, you know, I, I look at, you know, individual banks a lot and bank deposits are going down, but they're also going into money market funds. So where, where's this? I mean, we can, we can show this chart, actually. This, the, you, you made this chart. This is, in the, the green line is ex cumulative excess savings, which absolutely exploded higher in, in 2020, but has been declining from uh, about 2021, but it's, it is still above trend. And then in blue, we have the savings rate. Yes. I mean, there's a lot going on in this chart. So, you know, the blue dotted line shows the trend rate of growth of savings. And any time that savings are below that trend rate, I, there's basically a drawdown in cumulative say, excess savings. And when the solid blue line is above the trend line, you're building uh, excess savings and of course during the when the stimmy stimulus checks were handed out and and there was a big social uplift in social security benefits you saw these excess savings going through the roof now every five years there is a comprehensive revision to the national accounts and as a result of the the comprehensive revision in september these the the trajectory of these lines changed we we found that the the savings rate since the pandemic was actually higher than was previously calculated and as a result of that the cumulative excess savings are now over a trillion based on this kind of way of modeling them whereas previously they were at round about 500 billion 
So, you know, that's still a hell of a lot of excess savings that are somewhere in, in, in the financial system. But in addition to this, these excess savings that we're seeing here, the household sector is in great shape. You know, the, the, the total household wealth is something like 170 something trillion or so. Even the lower 50% of the income distribution has a much greater amount of wealth now than you know anything that it's 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 had in the past 10 years um housing wealth is is sky high equity wealth also i, I mean i know the stock the the equity market is down about 10 percent from its recent peak but households still are still sitting on a huge amount of accumulated wealth and so i think they you know they should feel confident that even with slower slower pay growth they're still confident enough to carry on spending. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of Web3 services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or DAP. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. Sounds like your middle-term outlook, you're not terribly constructive on bonds. You think the tenure could go to 5.5%, but just the, the, sh the risk of reward of shorting it is, is not attractive to you at, at this point. What do you think about the stock market or or any other asset class? I mean, you said credit, volatility, rates. It sounds like you kind of do, do everything in macro. What what stands out to you? What are opportunities that you are pursuing now or, oppor or opportunities where you say, you know what, not quite now, but I'm going to put this on my radar because this is getting interesting. <laughs> I've got actually one of the flattest books I've had for four years because, because the way... To me, there are not the most obvious opportunities out there that there were, say, a couple of years ago. For the equity market, of course, valuations are high, and can be, you know, if you look at the twelve-month trading earnings yield on the on the S and P five hundred, for example, it's it's you know something like five percent or whatever it is. Well, that doesn't compare too favorably to a risk-free rate that's close to five percent. Of course, you've got inflation, and if to some extent and growth, growth, growth in the earnings, yeah, yeah, and earnings growth, yeah. But you know, if you just look at it in terms of the equity risk premium, it's extremely, extremely low. So, to me, given the choice, I would rather have money invested in fixed income. Given the choice between nominal bonds, just regular treasury bonds, or tips. You know, which is which is capturing the real rate, plus, and you get the real rate, and you get the uplift from CPI inflation. I'd much rather have my money invested in tips for a long term investment. Now, equities. That said, I don't think we're going to have an equity market meltdown because I think growth will be sustained throughout next year, and people will find reasons to want to be involved. In the equity market still i just don't think you're going to have a rush to the exit you like tips do you like a certain duration of uh, treasury inflation protected securities ah uh, uh, <laughs> you know i haven't for me personally i've got some five-year tips and okay. that's in if, if you like in my pa portfolio where you know which are just locked away I, I don't even look at the market market i don't even care you know that's just there i know that's going to be a great investment but as far as where, whether you should go five years or 10 years, probably I would go even longer. You know, I, I go probably 10 years would be would be a good good place for me. But you, so you, what about the risk that real long term real rates go higher? What would have to happen for that to happen? And why do you think that's unlikely, I guess? It's unlikely, but I wouldn't rule it out. You know, I think we're in a we've entered a secular period of, of higher rates. 
So like I said before, higher fiscal deficits, a higher neutral rate, higher neutral real rate, and higher inflation. I think, I think if you look at the if you look at the great financial crisis and the period that followed, we were always going to have a decade of really tepid growth and low rates. You know, I think when the financial crisis happened, we all got busy reading Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, you know, plowing through that as fast as we could, 800 pages there or whatever it was. And, and they, were, they were spot on. They just said, you know, after you have a financial crisis, you can just pretty much write off the next 10 years. You're going to have slow growth and governments struggling to get fiscal deficits under control. And we did. We had a period of near zero rates. The yield curve was as flat as a pancake. And I think that is that is put into people's expectations a, a well, it's what behavioral economists call confirmation bias. You know, people are used to really low long term, uh, really low rates at the short end and, and, and long end rates. And I think that that was an exceptional period that has biased people's expectations going forward things are going to be very different we're going to have i don't want to call it a permanently a, not a permanent but a very long period of much higher rates but you sounds like you forecast stability as well you don't think they're going to shoot up from 4.5 percent to 8.5 percent in the same way they went from one to 4.5 percent no you think i think they'll settle out around five yeah, yeah. Well, let's say in a range four and a half to five and a half. Uh, you know, this is this is going to be the new normal. Um, so that and, means if, if sorry, if and when the Federal Reserve cuts, other central banks cut, they will cut a very small amount. They're not going to cut to three percent or two percent or even zero percent. They're going to cut one hundred basis points to four point five percent. So the new floor will be 4.5 percent and then everything else will be upward sloping from there the the five-year ten year i mean i I could be wrong the economy could go into a horrible meltdown but you know the way the way i see things the fed could cut 100 basis points or maybe more but we'll have an upward sloping yield curve we have these the you know a much greater supply of, of paper as you said from the much higher fiscal deficits and any slowdown in the economy that brings unemployment higher will increase those fiscal deficits and the supply of treasuries. So we're not going back to a situation where the yield curve was was super flat, where QE was encouraging people to extend in duration and then extend out on the credit spectrum and then you know move into equities. We're not going to have the same thing again. And I think we'll have uh, a yield curve that is 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 kind of disinvert certainly when the fed starts cutting rates i think that, of course the yield curve will disinvert but i think maybe the fed cuts 100 150 basis points over uh you know at some starting at some point during next year and then you know the longer longer term yields maybe get down to three and a half to four percent but will rise up again what is your sense from the the bear steepening where you know bonds are selling off but it's the long end of the treasury yield that are steepening so it's exiting inversion still inversion but but the long end is going up more than that the short end i you know explain, explain, uh, explaining for the audience it's, i know you do not a real believer in the inverted yield curve of you know yield curve is destiny but normally bear steepening occurs at the beginning of an economic cycle right right after the federal or right after central banks cut interest rates and then the long end goes up isn't it like how do you interpret what's going on now where the Federal Reserve hasn't cut? They've they've raised rates, but yet the the long end is is selling off. First of all, I would say that those people that said, right, yield curve inversion, that means we're going into a recession, they then they then say, Oh, well, no, that's not the key signal for a recession. It's when the yield curve steepens again after being inverted. That's the recession sign. Well, <laughs> I just think that what's going on with these yield curve dynamics, it's it's a reflection of the, the economic environment that we're in currently, where we haven't we haven't seen something like this. Uh, none of us in our lifetimes have seen something like this, where the economy during the pandemic, you know, we fired 20 million people, 
rehired them growth we had rates of growth that were in double digits both positive and negative and we said we're coming out we've, we've got an echo of that now where inflation has been sky high it's coming down fast but we don't know where it's going to settle and because of that you know it's very it's very difficult to to map typical yield curve dynamics onto where we are in the cycle in the economic cycle this is an economic cycle unlike anything any of us has experienced. Um, I think economists like to, to, to say, well, you know, this is where we are in the economic cycle. This is what happens. But this is, there is no precedent for this. Right. So a normal economic cycle, not that, you know, that necessarily exists, but central banks raise interest rates that imposes stress on the economy and there's a recession and then they, they lower them. What do you think about the appropriate level of interest rate is in order to, you know, for, for slowing down the economy? Like, is the fact that interest rates now are, you know, 5.5% instead of zero, is that having a slowdown effect on the economy? In other, if, if interest rates were still at zero, would we be in a huge, a huge boom? Yes, without a doubt, the increase in interest rates should be having some impact on the economy, but nowhere near as much as people might expect. And I think I've shown it in a couple of charts in my slide, in the slides that I sent you. First of all, as far as the mortgage market is concerned, yeah, that's the one. The average rate on the outstanding stock of mortgages, the average rate of all the 30-year mortgages that are out there is just 3.6%. Now, that's the blue line in that chart. Now, you can see it's gone up a little bit as, as, as people new entrants to the market have taken out a mortgage, they're paying a much higher rent rate. It's gone up a little bit, but nothing like the pace at which new mortgages, the, the average, the current average 30 year mortgage rate, that is close to 8%. But homeowners with their 3.6% mortgage rates, they're just not moving home. They're staying put. There's no need for them to, you know, if they can avoid it, they're not going to move home and 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 give up their their low cost mortgages for something that's going to cost them nearly eight percent. So, as far as households are concerned, this this increase in interest rates has not Im impacted them as much as maybe in the past it might might have done. Plus. Many, many households are very cash rich and they're doing very well out of this increase in interest rates. To what degree is that an American phenomenon only? You know, we should say you're, you're recording this from, from England, you're, you're across the pond. Yes, in America, a lot of people got a 3% mortgage. Now they're using that cash in a savings account and they're getting 5.5%. You know, they're, they're, they, individuals have net interest margins. It's, it's incredible. But isn't it true in Europe that you know, a lot of more mortgage are variable rate, shorter maturity, shorter, shorter duration? And so this narrative of, oh, higher rates cause this pain is actually true in, you know, in Europe and the rest of the world outside of the US. Absolutely. Absolutely. Throughout, I mean, the, you know, it's not, a, it's not a homogeneous market throughout Europe. But in the UK, typical mortgage fix is two to five years. We have 25-year mortgages, but the rate is fixed for two to five years. And in different countries throughout Europe, they have you know, different standard periods for the, for the fix, but they're relatively short compared to the US. So <clears throat> the, the impact of the rate rises isn't felt initially, but as each you know, every month there's a whole, you know, in the UK, I think about 100,000 mortgages that, that will reset into a new rate. And believe me, it is very, very painful. If you've had a, a two-year fix at something like one point whatever percent, and the current two-year fix is four point whatever, you're going to feel quite a bit of pain in, in your mortgage payments. So it's a very different market here in, in Europe. Um, but, you know, well done, the US. You know, it's fantastic. The 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 fixed rate thirty year mortgage is fantastic. There have been attempts to introduce something similar in the UK, but it just hasn't it just hasn't taken off. And how does that factor into your analysis of the economy in Europe, uh, whether in the UK or Germany or, or other places in Europe? Well, certainly we are seeing a much much 
weaker economy, signs of much weaker economic growth. I mean, Europe has pretty much stagnated throughout all three quarters of this year. In the UK, growth has been very, very patchy. Uh, just we do, we have a monthly GDP reading and the quarterly readings, and it's been weak. And you know, the Bank of England meeting today kept rates on hold at five and a quarter percent, even though inflation is still at six and change, whatever. But the Bank of England is not going to hike rates because it's quite clear that the economy is 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 weak, and and the impact of rate hikes is is filtering through quite quickly as mortgage mortgages get reset people are really feeling some pain so <clears throat> it's it's a very different dynamic here in europe to, to to what you have in the states i mean can we use the the r word risk recession to describe what europe is in or, or might be entering or do you view it more as a slowdown but but not a recession i think europe has spent the you know the whole year struggling with growth you know, we've had a, I think, a quarter of positive 0.1%, negative 0.1%, zero. You know, it's it's been like that. So, you know, you might not, it might not officially be termed a recession, but it's it's pretty it's pretty poor rate of economic activity. And the ECB is on hold now. It looks highly unlikely that they will put another hike in place. And if anything, they're probably going to start cutting s- sooner next year than than the fed than the fed and does that impact your your impact uh, your view on the euro against the dollar or the pound against the dollar to be honest with you rate differentials just looking at expected rate differentials current rate differentials and the impact on currencies it's something that seemed to work quite well in fx but for the last year or two fx has been pretty dead i mean even you know even the prime candidate dollar yen for example, you know, with what's going on there with the BOJ keeping rates negative and with yield curve control, what the Fed's been hiking. In theory, you know, you would expect a much, much greater sell-off in the yen, probably higher dollar yen, but, you know, it hasn't happened. And here we are anchored at about 150. It's, it's, FX has been tough for the past couple of years. I would say anyone that's purely focused on FX trading well, maybe they're much better than me, but I certainly haven't been able to make any money from it. Yes, I think I'm fortunate in that you know I know nothing about FX, but I actually I know that I know nothing about FX. So mm. you know, there's no danger. Whereas if you have a little <laughs> bit of knowledge, then that's that's where the danger is. <laughs> well, yes, I've got to be honest. I have tried to use my little bit of knowledge unsuccessfully for the last couple of years. I thought the UK would be a little bit more vibrant, the UK economy, than it has turned out to be. And I thought the Bank of England, the Bank of England was very, very slow to hike rates. I mean, inflation was, it's just, it's just it's quite staggering when you look at it. Inflation had gone north of 5% and the Bank of England moved its bank rate from 10 basis points to 25 basis points. I mean as if that was going to make any sort of difference and has been very, very cautious in hiking rates. Johnny, do you think that is a central bank policy of you have to reverse something, even if it's marginal, before you move on to the next step? In other words, like the Fed didn't want to go from zero to 2%, even though 2% would have been appropriate. They had to do 25, and then they had to do 50 to get to 75, and then they did 75 to get to 150, and they could, they could do another 70. You know, it's... it's uh, incremental just so i guess i don't know the the former johnny matthews of the world don't don't uh <laughs> implode the, the global financial system <laughs> possibly you're right in that in that respect but then you know to 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 just move by 15 basis points in in one increment is is you know when most of us would have looked at that and thought well that's that's just crazy and in fact they delayed it by a month they had guided towards the hike and then changed their minds and then put the hike in place the following month. So, And inflation in the UK was higher than the US. It was over 10%. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it was quite an achievement, really, to get it that high. We had food price inflation that was, was also much, much higher. Just everything was, was going up in price at a much faster rate. And we still have higher inflation, much higher inflation. 
you're right in in that you say, yeah, you've got to proceed carefully when you first exit the, that stimulative policy. But Parliament, you know, Parliament before they even made the first hike was criticising the Bank of England, England. There was a House of Lords committee that said, you know, the bank has a, a dangerous addiction to stimulus, which is a great way of describing them. They were still doing QE and carrying on with the zero rates when it was clear the economy, economic growth was picking up quite fast and inflation was going through the roof. So, <clears throat> yeah, OK, they had to move slowly. But after that, after they, you know, told the market this is what they were going to do and they were going to start hiking, they needed to put a, a much faster pace of hikes in place. And so looking at the the Bank of England curve, uh, yeah, Sonia or the you know your your Ibor curves, does you see any opportunities there or they roughly make sense? Like you, you look at the curves and you think, yeah, I, I think that's right. That's probably what the ECB is going to do. I think the ECB will delay their first hike probably – until the summer, but I think it should be the first quite cut. clear. Sorry, the first cut. Yes, the first cut until the summer. But it should be quite clear that inflation is is you know it's it's lower anyway to start with, and it's going to carry on declining next year. And growth will, you know, growth has been tepid already. But you know, you look at the at the PMIs in Europe, you look at signs of weakening labor demand, and you look at whatever forward-looking indicators you, you choose to pick up on, the outlook is pretty dismal for Europe. I hope things change, but it doesn't look good for Europe, I've got to be honest. And you don't see a trade there with European currencies because FX is its own world, but what about other asset classes, commodities, European equities? If, if you look at equities, they're not very well correlated with, with growth. A country's equity market is not very well. The performance of a country's equity market is not very well correlated with its growth. Like China has had huge growth past economic growth past 10 years. The stock market is flat. Yeah. Yep. And I, I, you know, certainly in Europe, you know, if you look at the the big companies that comprise the, the equity indices, most of their, you know, their, 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 their exposure is to, to the global economy. You know, I think something like 90% of the earnings from the FTSE come from outside the UK. To look at a, a specific country index and say, well, okay, you know, I think the growth is, is going to pick up in this country. I'm going to buy the FTSE. That, that would be a mistake. There's, there's too many other factors there. That makes sense. I, so on a valuation front, you're not that that's the, the main lens through you, you look, that you look at things, but you, you referenced, you know, equity risk premium earlier. I know that British stocks, the FTSE 100, is very cheap, but I also know that it's been cheap for a long time and that people have been saying that it's so cheap, it's a, it's a value, but that it may have been a little bit of a value trap. Do you have a view on on why you know, British equities are so cheap and why they may continue to be very cheap or they actually are very undervalued now and you know they are they are good value? Yeah, yeah, I do actually. I mean, I made the mistake of thinking, well, you know, this. You look at the valuations in, in in UK stocks, and you think, wow, you know, this is unbelievable. The PE is so low, the dividend yield is so high, and, and the dividend yield is is four four and a bit percent or whatever it is. But the index is comprised of some real old economy stocks. You've got oil companies, you've got banks, you've got mining companies. The banks, the banks are challenged by tighter regulations, increased capital requirements, and so on. And you know they blew themselves up during the financial crisis. They're not going to be given another chance to do that. So the return on equity is much lower. They're much less leveraged than they were at the time. The mining companies, you know, if, if you look at commodity prices, they've, they've come down a long way. China is struggling. I don't know how China gets through this this property crisis uh, quickly. I think it's going to be a very drawn out process. So the mining stocks have their own challenges. The oil companies, well, you know, we we, we saw some earnings. I didn't didn't pay close attention to BP and Shell, but they were you know sharply lower. We've all got tobacco stocks, and and that's just a dying industry. So there's a lot of these these old economy stocks that are. Um, they look great, 
they look great on paper, but in reality, you know, it is a value trap. And I've made the mistake of thinking, well, you know, these these the, these indexes, whether in Europe or the UK, these look like great value compared to the, the high flying, you know, the likes of the NASDAQ on, on these crazy valuations. But, you know, I was wrong and I'm out of that trade and I really don't particularly want to get back in. What about China? Chinese stocks are definitely uh, cheap on a historical basis, but they also could be a value trap. You said you think it will be a long time for China to get through that. Why is that? Because normally an economy is in recession. It's in it for a few months. It's in it for a year. It's in it for two years. You know, it's very rare to have like a silent decade where things just are you know, economic doom for a very long time. Normally things go up and they go down. What, what's your outlook on, on, on Chinese economy and then Chinese stocks, which, as you rightly pointed out a few minutes ago, are not always correlated? Well, as far as the property market is concerned, you know, there was a, a huge amount of excess leverage in, in, in the property market. We're seeing these property companies that are effectively defaulting on, on their loans. And this, what concerns me is the impact that this could have on the banks um, and, and the hit that some of the banks could take to their, their capital as a result of this, um, the bonds, of some of these Chinese companies were trading at, you know, 10 cents on the dollar, the equities, the equities are, are worthless. So there is a huge amount of restructuring to take place in the real estate market. Now, as I'm sure you know, Chinese savers don't have quite the same access to the capital markets that, 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 that we can enjoy. You know, we can invest in anything we like. There's all kinds of savings products. For Chinese households, the property market has been a great a way for them to save. And now that's that's taken one heck of a whack, and it's going to be challenged for, I would think, um, many, many months, maybe years. And because of that, I think, first of all, I think the government, the government is in a reasonably strong position in that they're debt to GDP ratio is much lower than anything that, you know, like we have in, in Europe or the US. So they, the government may take over some of the, some of the debt from local governments, which would, would help the situation or provide additional stimulus to help get things going. But I just think that uh, although the, the, the growth trajectory looks like it's on target to hit the, you know, to hit the 5% target this year, I'm not sure how easy it will be for, for China to continue growing at that pace. And so, okay, you know, you've got these cheap looking Chinese uh, equities, but the standards of corporate governance in that country are nothing like in the US or, or Europe. And you don't really know what, what you're guessing when you invest in, in, in these stocks. Um, so they're cheap for a reason. And I think, uh, but I, I, you know, to me, China seems like one of those places that I wouldn't want to invest my money. That makes sense. Going over to Japan, what is going on there? More than just you know, uh, stocks, which you know, if you, if you have a view, you can share it. But with the Bank of Japan having, you know, for probably I would say most of your career, held you know, rates at, at at zero, or or actually I, I don't know, but but you know, having been in a secular decline for for most of your career, and then holding interest rates at zero, and people say, oh, you got to short Japanese government bonds. That doesn't work out. Known as the widowmaker trade, is it finally the time to short Japanese government bonds now that yield curve control is being tweaked and the the it's the target is still at zero, but the band are being widened and then the band are widened again, and then the top end is is a reference range and they're changing the language. Like, is the ten year Japanese government bond yield going to two percent, going to three percent? Are there going to be people in your business of macro trading who are finally going to you know that's going to be a successful trade? Are people in the business? positioned now where they actually say, oh, it's going to happen so that if it doesn't happen, it will be a widow maker trade yet again. Yeah. Well, I think there's a graveyard full of traders who've tried this trade, you know, really it, it is. And the circumstances have, have seemed like it was, it was the right time on many previous occasions. And now where we are now, uh, does it make sense to, to set the JGB with a yield that's close to 1% now? 
well, you know, the, 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 the Japanese economy is very different. You know, the demographic challenges that they have will keep growth lower than we're used to in the US and Europe. There just isn't the supply of labor. So, you know, growth is a, economic growth is a combination of increasing the size of the workforce and productivity growth. And for Japan, you know, it's very difficult to increase the size of the, the, the workforce. I mean, there just aren't enough people. The population is declining. Japanese unemployment is something like 2%, well, 2.6%. You know, so you're just not going to see a dramatic increase in the pace of growth. Japanese growth is always going to be pretty slow. But you could see, if you have any faith in the Phillips curve at all, you could see a dramatic increase in the rate of inflation because, you know, demand for labor, while not high, is very high relative to the supply of labor. I agree. I agree. That is the one hope. That is the one hope of those that are going to, be brave enough to to go and short JGBs again. I'm not one of them. I just tried it once. I'm not going to try it again. The you're right. It, it's it's surprising though that that was my expectation as well. You know, you've got a restricted supply of labour. You've got inflation that's running at about core inflation running at about four percent. We expected. We, you know, other people I, I speak to expected wage, wage growth to pick up much faster than it did. We had a disappointing, disappointing round of wage negotiations in, in April. You know, there's these annual wage negotiations in Japan. And, and we're looking at the statistics of labor earnings. And they really have failed to live up to, to what you might expect from in a Phillips curve framework. We have. You know, the economy is doing okay, inflation is high, there's uh, demand for labor, and yet pay growth still lags inflation. So, but that said, of course, you know, this, these are, it's becoming increasingly difficult for Japan to keep all these plates spinning. You know, they're trying to avoid a rapid decline in the value of the currency. If the currency goes, you know, down the toilet, then imports are going to cost a lot more. It's going to impact inflation. But by the same token, they're trying to control the yield curve. They're still doing, effectively, they're doing quantitative easing by stepping in to buy JGBs whenever the yield goes above or comes close to their new reference point. And I think it's a, it's a very dangerous situation trying to keep all these plates spinning, particularly when the two... You know, the two, you've got the Ministry of Finance that's trying to push back against what the BOJ is doing. The BOJ is trying to keep rates low, and the Ministry of Finance is trying to stop the currency going into freefall. So <clears throat> the, two, the, two, the two strands of government, if you like, are, are pushing against each other. And what is the Ministry of Financing doing to stop the sell-off in the yen? I knew there were interventions to sell dollars and buy yen, but I thought that was for the Bank of Japan that was doing that. No, it's the Ministry of Finance that is responsible for, for managing the currency. Okay. And, and really up to now, because in the past, they, they, they would come in and do these occasional uh, interventions that would drive the current, drive dollar yen down two or three figures. That all, the, all they have to do, all they have been doing is warning of intervention. And that's enough for traders to think, ah, you know, I'm, I've been burnt before. I'm not going to pile into this dollar yen trade. And if you look at implied volatility in dollar yen, it's incredibly low under the circumstances, considering what's going on at the moment. I did have a trade on in a dollar yen strangle. And I just recently took it off. I did expect the volatility to pick up more than it has it's picked up a bit but i'm out the trade at some point this will get messy i'm sure we're going to have a discontinuous move at some point but then you know if you'd have asked me 10 years ago i'd have said the same thing and somehow the authorities seem to be keeping the plate spinning i like that you say i don't trade currencies and then the next thing you said well i did have a dollar yen strangle on <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i mean I try to be quite selective with what I do in FX. And, and Dolly N Strangle was really a kind of a 
a volatility play, expecting some kind of you know pickup. We did have a pickup in in realized volatility. We had some pretty big moves in the last couple of days, but you know it's to me just looking at the screen today, it looks like we're going back into this to and fro where where, where speculators will try and push the currency through through one fifty, and the Ministry of Finance will will put out a bit of verbal intervention, a warning of intervention, and and people will back off, will look to cover. Can you speak to so trading the strangle, trading the volatility, how trading volatility, investing in volatility, shorting it, volatility is different than trading the underlying asset and how, you know, maybe you, you know people who are extremely good at trading the fundamental thing, but it doesn't really trade over to volatility and they get they get hosed when they try and trade volatility. And, you know, if you're someone who has successfully traded both, how is that possible? Or, or, you know, do you have to sort of put a different hat on when you do it? That's a great question because I started my career at Salomon's as a derivatives trader. So I was trading options, which, you know, and you know, the, the, the option price is determined by this magic number that you put in the implied volatility. So I have, you know, well, a couple of decades of experience of trading vol. And I used to do a lot of relative value trades in volatility, trading a basket of stocks against the, the index. So it's kind of a correlation trade. You know, you want, you want the stocks to be volatile, but not the index. You know, you want the stocks to move in different directions and be super volatile, moving all over the place, but the index to stay relatively calm. That's, that's the idea of that trade. I've done all these kind of relative value trades. But one thing I learned after the financial crisis is that these relative value trades, you can, you can just forget them. Just they go out the window. You've got to get the big picture right. You've got to get the big picture macro view correct. Otherwise, you're just going to get blown out the water. Now, what I, what I do these days is any trade that I want to put on, I look at doing it through options, through call spreads, put spreads, or whatever. I look at the implied volatility. I try to find the best structure to give me the best payoff, the best bang for for the buck. And if implied volatility is low, and I have a particular directional view, I'll buy some out the money options. If implied volatility is very very high, I might sell <clears throat> some some calls or some puts or whatever. Or I might just trade the volatility. In other words, sell sell the the options and 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 hedge them to the death. But these, you know, we're getting into more complex things. The bottom line is, yeah, it helps when you know all these technical aspects of relative value and implied volatility and so on. It helps to get a better structure for the trade. But you've got to have the right idea in the first place. You've got to get your big macro view has got to be correct, because otherwise. You know, this 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 tinkering at the edges won't count for anything. What do you what do you mean the tinkering at the edges? Oh, in two thousand eight, did you mean that like there work there were correlations that that held true in a in a basis thing, but the assumptions weren't there? And I'll give an example, a much more simple example. People say in twenty twenty two, I think interest rates are going to rise, so I'm going to buy banks and I'm going to short tech stocks. Like clearly, that did really poorly. Like interest <laughs> rates did rise, but technology has smoked banks. So that's a simple basis trade. I, I'm, you know, tell us maybe about the other basis trades that don't hold true in 2008. In 2008, well, there are so many correlations. You know, you, you you could do a correlation. You know, it can't go above 100. But when you look at a basket of, if you take all the stocks from an index, uh, you can back out an implied correlation of these stocks, the daily movements, using a portfolio of options because you can say, well, okay, I think the implied correlation is, is very high. And, you know, like I said before, I'll sell the index volatility and I'll buy each, each individual component stock vol. And then if correlation is high, you're going to lose a lot of money. If correlation is low and the stocks are moving around up and down in opposite directions and the index kind of, flat lines, you'll make the money. And so this correlation tended to trade within within a band. But in 2008, of course, everything just went down, you know, down, 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 down. So the correlation went close to 
a hundred or went to two extremes, the likes of which we'd never seen before. And then you're talking about in equities, yeah, index volatility versus the equities in the index? In the index, yes. But that's that's just one example. I mean, there were similar sort of relative value trades in credit. I mean, that, that's where mortgages. it all that's that's where the the new the bomb was, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the mortgages, you know, and, and you know, the AAA tranche was supposed to be super, super safe. Nothing could happen there. And people would trade the, you know, the the subprime against the, you know, the 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 super senior tranche. And and these correlations broke down, everything went to hell, and then people want to get out the trade, and then you find that things get even worse. You know, there is no exit door. And you we saw a similar sort of thing during the LTCM crisis. Where were you at Bremen Howard or at City there? City. Okay. City during that. And and I remember it very well because we had at the time it was still Salamans. We had a big fixed income arb desk who were involved in pretty much all the same trades as LTCM. On the and same side? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Just re- replicated the whole lot. So, you know, in fixed income, there are these on the run, you know going along the off the run bonds versus the on the run bonds to try and capture a basis point a year, a basis point or two per year of, of interest rate differentials leveraged up hundreds of times. They, there was, uh, there were short long-term variant swaps, which is, it's a type of volatility product. So you can say, well, okay, five year realized volatility on an equity index, never been higher than 30, should we say. So, you know, implied volatility for five years is trading at 28, 30, we'll sell the hell out of it. And then it goes to 31, we'll sell some more, and then 32. And even though realized volatility isn't going to get there, they got squeezed out of the position. In fact... Yeah, and let me just say, for the audience, I, I think it's, if you short variance at 28 and it goes to 31... You don't lose three dollars. You lose no. a lot more than three dollars. There's a there's a kind of convex payoff yeah. to it, and the higher the volatility goes, the bigger your exposure, and so you're kind of chasing your tail trying to get out of this trade. And so you know, just coming back to the oh, there are horrible, horrible instances during the uh, financial crisis with variant swaps that just just you know just you know, <laughs> catastrophic losses at some of the banks. Yeah, and so you you, you worked at City uh, used to be Sal- Salman Brothers. There was there's a merger. She tells like, do you think the sort of swashbuckling days are over of taking lots of risk within the banks? How significant was that move? Uh, you know, of, of Dodd Frank and impo- like all these variant swaps and credit default swaps. They have a pretty high cost of capital, so it's prohibitively expensive for banks to carry a lot of that risk. They're still sort of the the broker and warehouse, you know, uh, but they're not warehousing it. So number one, that's my question. Number two, if so. Where did it go? Where's all this stuff doing? Is it is it hedge funds? I mean, do we know who these people are who are running these huge basis trades? It used to be it's at City. And and where, where is it now? Let's start your question about the banks. If you look at banks' return on total assets, it's very low. It's sub 1%. You know, So they have this massive portfolio of assets supported by a relatively small slice of equity. Now, prior to the financial crisis, you know, they le- over leverage themselves in, in risky assets with a very small cushion of equity to generate a much higher return on equity. Well, that's been, that, that way of operating has been closed down to them. So now the returns on equity of the banking sector are nothing like they used to be, and they probably won't get there again. So, as you rightly say, those kind of risks that the banks were taking have to go somewhere else. And partly you're right, it's into the hedge fund community, but those risks have been repriced. We've seen we've seen what can happen. Variant swaps back in the day, prior to 08, were done on an uncapped basis. So the losses were not only, in theory, limitless, but they also had that accelerating profile, you know, that just really, really accelerated as ball went higher. Well, now, typically, variant swaps are done with a cap. So, you know, if the strike on the variant swap, if you're selling vol at, say, 20, the strike will be at two and a half times that. I, did, I didn't know that. 
I know, no, no, I know for like, you know, tr- retail trading options, there's different levels of, you know, they're not going to allow you to sell a naked call, but you could sell a call spread. But interesting, institutions, you know, even the biggest bank of the world, they have that level, but for variant swaps of, you can't, you can't sell. Yeah, it, may, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, maybe there are uncapped variant swaps that are still done today. But, you know, from, from, from what I saw before, you know, when I was still actively doing these kind of things, it was all capped. And, and the cap, interestingly, presents its own challenges. There were, there were some that were capped prior to 08. And let's say you had a variant swap at 20 with a cap at 50. And variance, the, the, the implied volatility goes to 30. So you want to buy something back. So you buy the variant swap for 30 with a cap at 75, you know, at two and a half times. Well, now you've got a little call spread on volatility going between 50 and 75. And prior to 08, you would think, well, you know, that's never going to happen anyway. We don't have to worry about that. But after 08, during 08 and 09, it did. It went up to these extreme levels. So, <clears throat> you know, things, there's always, when the world blows up, there's always little things that happen to relative value trades or really complex derivatives that you didn't expect to happen so you've got to be very careful if you if you're just trading purely relative value trades there are little risks that are not obvious and and when things become discontinuous you can find yourself exposed to something that you never expected what might be an example of such a trade that is common today that has hidden risk or, or risks that you know it's it's easy to not pay attention to when times are good. And if there's a lack of such trades, that's a good thing. Maybe the financial system is less risky, but you tell me. <laughs> it's it's always difficult in advance to know exactly where this this stuff is 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 hidden. You know, it's only after the event when when the bodies float to the surface, you you can find say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that's what was the problem here. So at the moment nothing springs to mind that doesn't mean to say there isn't something out there i mean you know people point the finger at commercial real estate but i i you know i'm doubtful about that it's it's quite a small part of the banks loan books and and in the us uh, of the big banks you're right of the big banks yeah of, yes. of city and all this you know jp morgan yeah you're absolutely right so and so those banks won't fail won't be systemic but the regional banks which you know if you're in ohio you probably have a you know a bank that on Wall Street we would call a regional bank because you live in that region. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. There will be these regional bank blowups, but then again, you know, most years there's a few banks that fail. You know, and the FDIC is really brilliant at at going in on a Friday, putting someone else's name above the door, and then you know, comes Monday you can go to the ATM and still get your cash out. It's, it's business as usual with a different under a different owner. So those those regional banks do do disappear quite frequently, but it's not a systemic risk in that respect, unless and and commercial property, sure, it's a big, it's a much bigger proportion of their loan books, but you know, in in the whole, it's not it's not a massive exposure. Besides which, commercial real estate, you know, it it, it covers a number of things. It's not it's not just office blocks. It's a it's apartment rates, it's construction loans, it's a number of things. And if, if, if it's just office blocks, yeah, then, then that's a problem, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And do you have any view on like sectors within stocks? Like for example, the the airline stocks are, have been tanking, you know, regional banks are not doing well. And you know, the sectors that are doing well, you know, NVIDIA and stuff, stuff like that. Like, do you have any view on that or you're more macro and you kind of stick to your macro knitting? Yes, I'm more macro, but my view was wrong anyway. I mean, I never thought I never thought these these highly valued tech stocks could carry on growing at the pace they're growing, and and you know the 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 rally just astonished me this year. But I've been wrong about that, without doubt. I've been wrong, and you look at the valuations of these stocks, extremely extremely high. You know, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty PE is whatever. It hasn't seemed to matter, and it hasn't seemed to matter. For, for two reasons. One is 
investors don't care. <laughs> they want to own them. But also the earnings growth has been incredibly strong. And of course, we don't know what AI will do. It's going to be a great productivity enhancement, but we just don't know. So there is that unknown additional upside to the stocks. And, and, and I guess people are happy to pay a premium for that. Yes, and talk about there being certain correlations and then the correlations changes. You know, last year, if bonds sold off, long duration tech stocks, unprofitable tech stocks would crash that day. And, uh, you know, I went into this year assuming that that would be the case, but it's, it's not. You know, bonds sold off for most of this year, but tech stocks have done really well. Well, you're so in just good shows, company. Correlations change and you got to adjust. Yeah, you're in good company there, Jack. You know, all these relationships, especially when you look at historic correlations, you can see, and it's often the case, you can see very strong historic correlations. And then something changes, then it just breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. Same kind of thing, you know, if you look at value versus growth stocks and, and the shape of the yield curve, that kind of stuff, it, it worked for years and then suddenly doesn't work anymore. Things change. Not only that, you know, the categories of stocks, stocks that are categorized as value mm -hmm. or growth or consumer discretionary or, you know, the stocks the stocks that are in those categories change their own characteristics. You know, it's very difficult to, to, to really trade on that basis, trying to trade those correlations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I look like the financial sector within stocks and 10 years ago, it had a lot of regional banks. It didn't have, you know, technology companies like Visa and MasterCard that are, you know, eternal compounders and the, the, the weightings and, and composition of, of indices totally changed. And yeah, I mean, Apple, I think Apple, Apple's a tech star, I, I think, in the technology sector. But, you know, I would say, look, going on the, the subway, everyone has a, an iPhone, so maybe it's a consumer staple, you know. But, yeah, and then we've got telcos that includes, what is it, Alphabet and, yep. and, and Netflix. I mean, but yeah, that's communication. They're all, they're all made up. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, when you, when you do some kind of historical correlation between these sectors and try to look for a relationship with interest rates, you know, you're running the risk of, of just just looking for the wrong thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, Johnny, we'll leave it there. Th thanks so much for, for joining us. So people could find you on Twitter at super underscore macro and your, your research note, people could find out more at super dash macro.com. Just tell people, give people a little bit of a sense of, you know, and I, you know, luckily, you know, giving me access to, to your note, what, what is in the note? What are you trying to, to flag for, for people and how it helps your own research process? And then hopefully, you know, people reading the note as well. Yes. Well, I, you know, I started this writing this note about three or four years ago, but it was only for institutional investors. And now we're trying to, we're going to give it a, a broader audience retail and, and private investors. The note, the note is basically a, a very brief summary of what happened in the market the prior day. And I'm not just talking about, you know, S&P went up and this went down and this happened and that happened. It's the macro, the macro uh, news and its impact on markets and some kind of opinion, often an opinion from me for what I think the, the implications are. So that's, that's the daily note. And then once a week on the weekend, I do a more in-depth uh, analysis where I'll kind of summarize what's gone on in the week and talk about what what I think is going to happen and then I I do a deeper dive into the markets to look for where there's there's pockets of of, of value and trades that I think are are worthwhile doing and I also I've kept in that I also talk about the trades that I actually have on so you know I I I, I tell the readers what I'm going to, to do. These are not trade recommendations. Let me just mm -hmm. say that. It's just what I'm doing, and I update them on the results of that. So, you know, for 2022, of course, that was a massive year. My little portfolio made close to 100%. And then this year, it's been it's been difficult. The, the portfolio is just slightly ahead for the year. But I'm honest. You know, I don't say, oh, yeah, by the way, we covered that. Sorry, I didn't tell you about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what's in the note. And yes, as you said, you can you can uh, take a look at the website, www.super-macro.com. So that 100% year, I bet a lot, a lot of that was shorting bonds. And you, you said you, you sized it big, and it sounds like you, know, you sized it pretty big. Did you have a lot of confidence 
not not just that oh these yields are going to go up but that the risk of them going down you know you would cover it because you know what the 10 year is going to go to zero percent i've got to be honest with you i just had no doubt in my mind these yields were going up there was not a shadow of doubt that something was going to drive the yields back down to zero and so the portfolio was leveraged five times at the start of 2022 to 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 short duration what what the 10 year the long with yeah. the 30 year 10 yeah it's like it's like i said you know you can you, you can get too clever thinking looking at relative value should i do the 30 year should i do the 10 year should i do a combination of fives and tens you know it's yeah. very very simple just treasury futures which are which well really it's a, a you know, a, a seven to 10 year bond is deliverable. Uh, but yeah, just treasury futures, very, very easy. Just short the hell out of those. That, and that was right. the trade. But you had an assumption about how, like, what was your max drawdown? Like a 5X leverage on, on S&P 500 would be horrifically yeah. mismanaged because, you know, 20% you're wiped out, 50% you're, you owe many times more than your principal. But, you know, the, I mean, bonds have rallied 40%, but, uh, you know, you, you, had, you had stops and stuff like that. But. Yeah, well, at times I would stop out of part of the trade. Other times I had upside calls, short dated upside calls to protect me. Mm-hmm. And certainly as the trade kind of matured, and as we came into this year, I certainly made much greater use of, of, of calls to protect the position from a, a retracement. So that was the main trade in 2022. But also I had a short position in the S&P 500. I did have I did try long footsie short S and P. Didn't really work out that well, you know. It's just, just uh, to be honest with you, the 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 footsie leg of it was kind of a waste of time. You, you, you know, it's, it's, at the time it was best to just be short the S and P, and and I did use options from time to time. And and it was it was quite an easy year last year. This year has been a bit bit tougher and that's you know that's reflected in the note and that's reflected also in the fact that i really don't have much on at the moment Mm -hmm. particularly now the way things are i appreciate that well johnny thanks so much for, for coming on sharing your insights and thanks everyone for watching thank you jack it's been a pleasure forward guidance the program you just enjoyed hopefully can be viewed on youtube at blockworks macro or heard as a podcast on apple podcast and spotify Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.